السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We always praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We can blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His entire household and all his companions And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us and our offspring The ummah at large and humanity at large May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all every form of goodness And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from all evil Amin. My brothers and sisters If I were to ask you as a Muslim Name me one of the most important pillars of Islam. <coughs> I think the bulk of us would say Salah is extremely important as is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that it is definitely one of the five founding pillars of Islam. If the Salah is not in order, then a Muslim's life will not be in order. So there is much encouragement and in fact instruction in Islam that we fulfill our salah as a matter of importance and give it preference over anything and everything. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to fulfill the salah in a correct manner. If we were to take a close look at this salah, we would realize one thing, that it does not benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He does not need it from us. He is the owner of all praise even if we do not praise Him. And He is the owner of grandeur even if we do not declare it. And He is the one in whose hand lies the control of absolutely every aspect of existence even if we do not acknowledge that. So Allah does not need us to acknowledge anything, nor does He need us to do anything in order to confirm what He owns. He owns it. And He owns myself and yourselves. And I am going to return to Him. And whilst I am in this short life, I would like many favors from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He does not need a single favor from me. But I require so many favors. I need a good eyesight. I need a good respiratory system. I need good health in a nutshell. I would like to have sustenance enough that I can lead a life of at least comfort and my children. And I would like weather that would be good and so on and protected from evil and whatever else. All these are the favors of Allah upon us. And Allah says, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا If you were going to try and count the favors of Allah upon you, you will never ever be able to count them all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. So one of the things He has asked us to do as a means of completion of these favors is to fulfill salah. So salah in actual fact is a gift for me. It is something that will make me and you better people. It results in discipline in our lives. It regularizes the day and regulates the way we do things. And it makes me a person who can concentrate better on the work that I'm doing because after every little while, I need a break where I do something completely different and this is being discovered by science and medicine. If you were to start working in the morning in an office and you are working very, very hard, you need some form of motivation, you need some form of meditation, you need some form of change in order to get back to the workplace in a refreshed manner. So what happens? They give you a break. They give you a tea break, and they give you a lunch break, and they try their best. And nowadays what we learn, and this is something very interesting, is that they are saying, why don't you close your eyes and meditate, try and do something completely different, think about this, think about that. But as Muslims, we've got it from a long, long time, and still we don't dedicate ourselves with salah. But that will benefit unless we try our best to maximize the concentration in that salah. So each person achieves a reward according to the amount of concentration they have. And each person achieves the benefits of salah according to the amount of concentration they have. So if I want to maximize the benefit, I need to train myself 
to cut off completely from all my worries and everything else, leave it outside the door. When I am on my place of salah, I must forget everything. I declare Allahu Akbar, the one who made me is the greatest. Whatever problems I have, the solution in his hands. If I am to leave this dunya right now, I'm going to go back to him and he is most merciful. Have that hope. We need to be feeling it. I'm cut off from everything else. Shaitan then comes to us and tries to make us think about things that have gone wrong through our day and commitments we have and possibly various other matters we'd like to accomplish. So now here comes the devil and we as human beings, we just started our prayer and next thing we start thinking about, I have to do this straight after the prayer. This man is taking too long. The time is this. And you know what? I need to get this done. That man owes me money. He's standing right next to me. As soon as I'm finished, I'm going to get hold of him. All these type of thoughts reduce the benefit of salah. In actual fact, Allah forgives us, but we are insulting Allah. Allah forgives us. We are insulting Him because we should be trying our best to ward off such thoughts as best as possible. Because this is benefiting me. It's an act of worship for my Maker. And Allah does not need it. I am in need of it. And Allah says, you will be helped by the concentration in it. And this is why we always say, my brothers and sisters, we are at a great loss if we have not attempted to look into the meanings of the words that we utter in Salah. You know, when a person enters the fold of Islam, or as a child grows up, they are taught how to read Salah, sometimes parrot fashion, because we have to adopt and adapt to the Arabic language. And we have to learn that language in order, well, one of the reasons is to be protecting the Qur'an, so that if anyone were to make a mistake in the original words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any lay Muslim would be able to say, listen, this is not the word of Allah, this is what it is. And this is why if I were to make a blunder standing in the front here in the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is your right to correct me and I am not allowed to feel bad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. That is the uniqueness of the Muslim ummah. And this is why, let's resolve, we will make an attempt to try or we will make an attempt to learn the meanings of the words that we read in salah so that we can concentrate better. Believe me, if you know the meanings of what you say, the concentration will be much, much more focused and much better. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us concentration. Let's get to one powerful hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which I wish to speak about for a little while. It is the narration of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu which is recorded in At-Tabarani and he says that a man once walked in to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's presence and he says, O Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, give me some advice and be brief. Imagine this, we would consider it disrespectful if someone tells you, give me advice and be brief. Who are you to tell me to be brief? You either want the advice or not. Or you could say, you know what, I've got a little bit of time, give me some advice. But anyway, the Prophet ﷺ, why these words are recorded is that everyone has a different style of speech. Not everyone can ask in a beautiful way. But the, the point is, get the message across. It's an opportunity. Even if someone has been slightly rude, Ignore the rudeness for a moment for something bigger, for the bigger picture. <coughs> this is a very powerful lesson we learned from Muhammad sallallahu Sometimes you have an opportunity of achieving something great, but because someone has been impolite or someone has been rude to you, you then just turn away and you become upset and so on. Look, Muhammad sallallahu knowing that he is the best of creation and he is the Nabi and the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did not get upset. He got straight to the point. He says, when you fulfill your prayer, he says, Salli salata muwadda'id. When you fulfill your prayer, fulfill it as though it is the last prayer you are ever going to be getting an opportunity to fulfill. And then he says, if you do not see Allah, remember that He is watching you. Amazing wording. So Allah is watching me. I am imagining myself a little small speck of a creature of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, standing in front of him, putting my head on the ground for him, for my maker. Imagine if someone had to come to you and bow down completely. We would be so uncomfortable, we would actually want to stop it. 
I'm not worth being bowed to, not at all. And we would never allow someone to prostrate to us, impossible. And we would never prostrate to anything or anyone. But to the one who made me, we owe it. We owe it completely. As a favor upon us, as a gift for us, we fall prostrate to say, Oh my maker, I'm going to return to you. When I come back to you, just record the fact that I actually worshipped you. Who is the owner of worship? Only the one who made you. That's what Islam is all about, monotheism. You only worship he who made you, no one else. So, if I were to look into this narration of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I would come to realize a few powerful pointers. One is that Allah has made compulsory certain things. From amongst them, certain units of prayer are compulsory. We call them raka'at. So for every one of the five prayers, there are some units that are compulsory, some units that are voluntary. The compulsory raka'at, for example, I'm not allowed to leave them. If I do, I'm sinful. I'm sinful. And if I fulfill them correctly, I will be achieving such a great benefit that there is another narration of the Prophet wasallam wherein another man came to him and told him, O oh, Messenger wasallam, what should I do, what is my duty and so on. And tell me something that I don't need to ask anyone after you. And there are several wordings of the same narration. The Prophet ﷺ in one of those narrations says that you believe in Allah and the Prophet ﷺ, meaning the declaration of the faith obviously, and then fulfill your prayer. And here he was speaking of the obligatory prayer, which means the compulsory units of every prayer. And then he says, fulfill your zakah, which is the percentage of arms that is to be given to the poor. And then you fast during the month of Ramadan. And if you are able and capable, then go for Hajj. The man says, if I do not do, will I achieve paradise if I do this? Will I achieve paradise if I do just this? And the Prophet says, yes, you will. So as he walks away, he says, I bear witness that I'm not going to decrease nor increase from what I was told today. Which means he's going to fulfill what is compulsory and obligatory upon him. And as he's walking away, subhanAllah, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam points at him and tells his companions who were seated there, if any one of you would like to see a man from heaven, look at that man. Amazing. Simple. Quite simple. So he did not ask us to fulfill so many prayers without concentration. Rather, Fulfill what is obligatory with proper concentration. Then you fulfill as much as you can thereafter because it is highly encouraged to engage in voluntary prayer but with quality in mind, not the quantity. What this would mean is you find sometimes we would like to complete. So someone says, okay, you need to read two units after the salah and another two units. And so then we read the compulsory prayer and then we get up for the other two units as though we are doing Allah a favor. And we are quite terrible in our salah that we dart down and up. Subhanallah, as though, you know what, I just want to get completed with the number because I have to finish this anyway. And that is wrong as a Muslim. Take a look at the verses of the Quran. I read one for you from Surah Mulk, right at the beginning. Allah says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا It is He who has created death and life in order to test you who from amongst you has better deeds, not more deeds. So if someone is to fulfill 20 raka'at, for example, in the day, and there is no concentration in any of that, then a person who fulfills just what was obligatory with proper concentration is far better in reward and in fulfillment of the obligation that he has unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> so the point being raised is when we go back to the hadith where the Prophet says, every prayer of yours, fulfill it as though it's the last one you are ever going to be able to fulfill, your problem will be solved. What problem will be solved? One day, it will definitely be true. What does that mean? That means that if I have a habit, say for example, every time I pray, I feel within me that, look, this might just be the last opportunity I have, so let me take my time. I go into sujood. The closest you can ever get to Allah is the prostration, known as sajda or sujood. 
the closest that a slave is unto his maker is when he is in the position of prostration. That's the closest you and I can get. Why should I quickly spring up as though someone has fixed a spring on my forehead and I'm just bouncing down and bouncing back up? Why should I do that? This might be my last moment <coughs> I can spend my time declaring the greatness of my maker. Subhanahu <coughs> Rabbi al-A'la. Praise be to you, my maker, the one in whose hands is entire control of every aspect of not only my existence but everything else in existence and at the same time I declare that you are the highest Allah. that's what you're saying when you're down there and I need to repeat it again and I repeat it a third time and imagine if that was my last prayer do you think that the Almighty would just ignore that? never and like I said one day it will be the last prayer because whenever my debt is written, or yours, if we have developed this habit of fulfilling salah as though it is the last one, then one day it will definitely be the last one. So we will never ever lose. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. So my brothers and sisters, it is important. Number one, do not compromise your salah. Never. Come what may. We get up for salah to fajr. There is a different spirituality through the day. When we have started off by praising the one who gave us that day. We are going out to work. We have praised the one in whose hands is the sustenance that I'm going out to earn. So there will be blessings in whatever I do. It has been proven that those who fulfill the morning prayer with maximum concentration, even their character improves throughout that day. You feel blessed. Whereas a person who just missed it, and you know, as the one narration says, the shaitan pees in your ear if you miss your salat al fajr. And what happens, the entire day you are literally a person who is on edge. Any small thing can spark you off. You get upset. That's because, brother, you did not wake up before the sun rose. The sun rose, then you rose. We are taught, you rise, then the sun rises. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a good rising. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a proper resurrection with the right people. I mean. So we don't compromise our salah. Then it comes to salat al dhuhr the afternoon prayer. Imagine a warm day, mashallah, we've just worked hard. They say in the morning your concentration span is more than the afternoon. And what happens, you can concentrate a little bit longer. So you have naturally the working hours calculated by the fundis of the world. They say if you work a longer hours, then you have a lunch break and in the afternoon shorter hours. If you take a look at how salah is cut, it's cut in order to fit that and even better than that. So you have from Fajr to Dhuhr is the longest time. You can get all your work and after that, try making wudu with beautiful cold water. And you know, you have your face washed, you have your masah on your head and so on. You wash your hands, your feet and so on. You gargle. The refreshing feeling. You totally change whatever you've been doing through the morning and you're now concentrating on something completely and totally different. How amazing, how amazing. Yet we don't understand the value of it. We stop and eat physical food, but we forget the spiritual food. And this is why, brothers and sisters, it's important for us to know that some of the benefits of salah, we will never know them, but we would have already benefited from. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us great benefit. After that you have salatul asr. Then you have Maghrib. Notice the gap is becoming smaller and smaller. The shortest gap being between Maghrib and Isha. And you fulfill your Isha prayer, declaring the end of the day, and you recline in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ready to get up before the sun rises once again. That is a Muslim. Not forgetting that every time I go down in prayer, I need to make sure that I realize this might just be the last time that I am going down. And therefore, take your time. And that is the core message I'd like you to take home and the advice is for myself as well. Let us learn to change our lives by taking our time when we pray. Take your time. You know one narration of the Prophet ﷺ, when they asked about how he used to pray, they, they were told that he used to go into Rukur for as long as he stood. And then he stood up for as long as he was in Rukur. And then he went into prostration for as long as he stood up. And then he sat between the two prostrations for as long as he was in the prostration. Which means there was a long time as he was getting up from the different postures. It was quite a long time. Now with us, mashallah, you know we've minimized everything. Technological advancement, mashallah, we would all love to see things happening quick, quick. So the minimum at least 
is that we say Subhana Rabbi al ala thrice. Why do we have to stick to the minimum all the time? Imagine someone says, I'm employing you, and the minimum wage is a hundred bucks, a hundred dollars. Okay? You're going to stay on that for ten years. Come on, you're going to look at it and say, but don't I get a promotion? Subhanallah. So, why do we want to stick to the minimum number of tasbihat? You know, the minimum number of de- words that we need to utter. Minimum, and I'm out. Let's ask ourselves, we want the blessings of Allah. Like I started by saying, this is the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. Why is it that we do not take our time and we do not realize, let me increase now as I'm becoming a little bit older, let me also spend more time with my maker. Let me spend a little bit more time with my maker. I hope and I pray the few words that I've said this afternoon can motivate myself and yourselves to concentrate a bit more in prayer and at the same time to take our time when it comes to dealing with the maker who gave you this entire life and the one whom we are going to return to unique relationship, the one who develops it shall definitely be a bearer of good news. May Allah grant us the books that He is going to give us of our own records in our right hand. And remember, a prayer, there is something powerful about it. When you fulfill one salah, did you ever know that if you were to fulfill the next one properly, it would be an automatic expiation of the minor things that are committed between the two prayers. Did you know that? It's amazing. The same applies to Jumu'ah. If you are here and attend early in Jumu'ah, make sure that you fulfill it correctly and properly. The minor sins between this Jumu'ah and the last Jumu'ah automatically deleted even though you may not have even felt. May Allah grant us goodness. Major sins always require direct repentance, but the minor sins, they are deleted just like that by you engaging in good deeds. This is why the hadith says, أَتْبِئِتْ سَيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُوهَا if you follow up a bad deed with good deeds thereafter, the bad ones will automatically be wiped out.